the 10 first women world leaders. Through most of history and across the world, the leaders of most tribes, realms, and nations have been men. But in the 1940s, the first woman in history rose to become a non-royal head of state. Since then, more and more women each decade have been taking political office and rising to the top jobs. Today, we'll take a high-level look at the lives and careers of the first 10 women to be elected or appointed head of state, i.e. president, or head of government, i.e. prime minister. Some were admirable leaders. Some remain highly controversial. But the point is not their heroinism or perfection. One of the main reasons women are held back from top jobs is because they are held to much higher standards and judged far more harshly for doing the same things male politicians frequently get away with. The point is their historic achievements, cracking the glass ceiling and looking at a timeline of when and how women were given the chance to lead their nations. We'll also take a look at the 10 longest serving female world leaders, why it's taken so much of history for women to gain leadership roles, which nations have had the most female leaders, the correlation between women leadership and a nation's happiness, and we'll look at historic trends and a view towards the future of women taking leadership across the world. The 10 First Women World Leaders Kartik Anchima Tuka was the first ever female non-royal head of state. She was born in 1912 in Tuva, a region long disputed between China, Mongolia, and Russia. Her family were peasant hunters. When Kartik was six, her father died of smallpox. She was taken in by more prosperous relatives and given an education, a rarity for girls. In 1924, the Tuvan People's Republic became an independent nation, with a great deal of Soviet influence. Kurtik worked as a government clerk. She impressed leaders and was sent to Moscow for a university course. After her return, she was put in charge of propaganda and then women's affairs. She worked to improve education and economic conditions for women. In April 1940, Kurtik was appointed chair of the Presidium of Little Kural, the head of state of the Tuvan People's Republic. But with the world focused on Nazi Germany, her landmark achievement went largely unnoticed. That year, she married fellow politician Salchak Tuka. The chairwoman mobilized Tuvans to join the Soviet army against Hitler. In November 1944, she masterminded a petition for her nation to be annexed by the USSR. Thus, Kartik was no longer a head of state, but she continued her leadership role in Tuva until 1962, when she stepped into a supporting role as vice chairwoman responsible for social welfare, health, education, culture, sport, and propaganda. She retired in 1972 and died in 2008, age 96. In 1960, Siri Mavo Mike of Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka, became the world's first female prime minister. She was born in 1916 into an aristocratic family and was educated in English schools. She worked for social programs improving the lives of rural women and girls before marrying SWRD Bandarinaik and starting a family. He founded the Socialist Sri Lanka Freedom Party and became prime minister in 1956. Siri Mavo was first lady and an informal advisor to her husband. SWRD was assassinated in 1949 and Siri Mavo succeeded him as chair of the party. She then won the 1960 election and became prime minister. She attempted to reform the former British colony into a socialist republic and changed the administrative language from English to Sinhala. Economic problems plagued Ceylon and the prime minister alienated the Tamil ethnic minority. She survived an attempted coup in 1962 and was unseated in 65, only to win election again in 1970. 
she oversaw a new constitution and the formation of the Sri Lankan Republic, breaking with the British Empire. Sidimavo created the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs and appointed the first female cabinet member aside from herself. She lost election in 1977, and the new government greatly reduced democratic rights. Sidimavo was stripped of her own civil rights and barred from politics for seven years. In 1983, Tamils rose up and Sri Lanka fell into civil war. In 88, Siti Mavo ran for re-election but lost. She became leader of the opposition and advocated for reconciliation in the civil war. In 1994, her daughter Chandrika was elected president. She appointed her mother prime minister for a third term. She served until her retirement in 2000 and died two months later at the age of 84. Indira Gandhi was of no relation to the renowned Indian revolutionary Mahatma Gandhi, though she did know him in her childhood. Indira was born in 1917. She was the only surviving child of Jawaharlal Nehru, a leading figure in the movement for independence from Britain and the nation's first prime minister. During his premiership, Indira was a key assistant. In 1959, she was elected president of the Indian National Congress. She married Feroz Gandhi and had two sons. After her father's death, she moved to the upper house in 64 and became prime minister in 1966. She centralized power and went to war with Pakistan. India won, Pakistan was divided, and Bangladesh was created. In the 1970s, there were calls for revolution against the government, so Indira declared a state of emergency for two years, during which civil liberties were suspended. The press was censored and atrocities were carried out. In 1977, she called an election, expecting the people to vindicate her rule. She grossly misjudged her popularity by reading censored newspapers, and she lost the election but she won the premiership back in the 1980 election. A Sikh political opponent and his followers set up a military fort next to the Golden Temple, the holiest site in the religion. Indira ordered the army to remove him. Parts of the temple were destroyed and thousands of innocent pilgrims were killed. In revenge, two of Indira's Sikh bodyguards came up to her in her residential garden and shot her 30 times. She was 66. Her son Rajiv became prime minister. He was assassinated by a suicide bomber in 1991. Golda Meir was born Goldi Mabovich in Kiev, then part of the Russian Empire in 1898. She immigrated to Wisconsin in the U.S. at the age of eight. There she attended university and became a teacher. In 1921, she and her husband immigrated to Palestine and settled on a kibbutz or commune. She became the political representative of the kibbutz. During World War II, Goldie was a forceful spokesperson for the Zionist cause to create a Jewish state in Palestine. In 1948, she signed Israel's Independence Declaration. The next year, she was elected to Parliament. As Minister of Labor, she carried out major infrastructure projects and supported unrestricted Jewish immigration to Israel. She became Foreign Minister in 1956 and Hebrewized her name from Goldie Meyerson to Golda Meir. After Israel's victory in the Six-Day War against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, she helped merge several political parties into the Israel Labor Party. She was appointed prime minister in 1969. She traveled widely and hosted the Chancellor of West Germany. She tried to broker peace in the Middle East, but saw the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Israel suffered heavy losses before defeating the invading armies. The angry public called for Golda's resignation in 1974. She died in 1978 of lymphoma at the age of 80. Isabel Padon became the world's first female president in 1974. 
She was born in 1931 into a middle-class family in Argentina. She dropped out of school to become a nightclub dancer, which is how she met former president Juan Perón. His second wife had been famous Eva Evita Perón. Isabel became his third. She was 30 and he was 65. The couple lived in Spain while Juan was in exile. Isabel traveled to Argentina several times to gain political support for her husband. In 1973, the pair returned and Juan won the presidency. Isabel was the first lady and vice president, just as Evita had tried to be before her untimely death. Juan's frequent illnesses elevated his wife to acting president. In 1974, Juan suffered a heart attack and died at 78. Isabel thus succeeded him as president. Argentina was plagued by inflation, unrest, and violence. Isabel appointed new cabinet ministers, printed money, and imposed a state of siege as the country came to the brink of anarchy. She held power for two years, before military officers staged a coup and placed her under house arrest for the next five years. In 1981, she was released but exiled to Spain, where she remains to this day. She is 92 years old. Elisabeth Dumétion was born in 1925 in what was then French Equatorial Africa. Her father was a postal worker and her mother a farmer. She received a rudimentary education in reading and writing from a Catholic school. She had business and math skills and a strong personality, which made her a popular leader among the village women. She married twice and had a daughter. In 1940, she got involved in the liberation struggle. She gave speeches which motivated and united different groups and helped to create a sense of national identity. She became head of the women's group in the Movement for Social Evolution of Black Africa, MESAN party. In 1960, the Central African Republic gained independence from France. Elisabeth was at the top advising the male leaders, playing peacemaker and trying to improve the lives of her people. The first dictator of the new nation was overthrown by Jean Bidel Bocassa, who declared himself president for life. Popular Elisabeth was appointed vice president. In 1975, she became prime minister. She worked to strengthen the income and position of women and got many political prisoners set free. She wasn't afraid to challenge the president, but when she opposed his plan to name himself emperor, she was fired. Bokassa was overthrown in 1979, and Elizabeth was arrested. She served a short prison term and was barred from politics. In 1993, the junta was overthrown, and the new elected government granted Elizabeth compensation for the unjust treatment she had suffered. She remained a prominent figure until her death in 2005 at the age of 80, when she was buried with official honors. Margaret Thatcher was born in 1925. She studied chemistry at Oxford University and worked as a research chemist before becoming a barrister. She married and had two children. She was elected a member of parliament in 1959, age 34. She was appointed secretary of state for education and science in 1970. In 1975, she won election for the conservative party leadership and became leader of the opposition. In 1979, the conservative party won the general election and Margaret became prime minister. In an attempt to reverse high inflation, she emphasized deregulation, privatization of state-owned companies, and crippled trade unions. Much like her American ally, Ronald Reagan, her economic policies, known as Thatcherism, caused a boom in the 1980s, but they built the scaffolding for socioeconomic problems still being felt today. Economic recovery and victory in the Falklands War resulted in her landslide re-election in 1983. In 1984, she survived an assassination attempt by the Irish Republican Army IRA, and achieved a political win against striking miners. She won a third term in 87. 
A Soviet journalist dubbed her the Iron Lady for her uncompromising style. Her poll tax and anti-European views made her unpopular in the party, and she was forced out of 10 Downing Street in 1990 after 11 years in power. In 1992, she was created Baroness Thatcher by Queen Elizabeth. She died in 2013, age 87, after a stroke. Maria de Lourdes Pintacielgo was born in 1930 and raised by a single mother. She earned a degree in industrial chemical engineering and embarked on a career. She was promoted to project director and took leadership positions in several Catholic women's organizations, including one appointed by the Vatican. She left her career in engineering to run Portugal's Program for Development and Social Change. She led government groups on women's affairs and was a UN delegate. In the 1974 Carnation Revolution, young liberal military officers overthrew the authoritarian government and Portugal transitioned to democracy. Maria became Minister for Social Affairs. In 1979, she was appointed Prime Minister. She modernized the social welfare system, made social security universal, and improved health care, education, and labor legislation. After five months in office, her party was defeated, and Maria lost the premiership. In 1986, she ran for president as an independent and won 7% of the vote. She was elected to the European Parliament and chaired the UN Independent Commission for Population and Quality of Life for a decade. Maria died of a heart attack in 2004, age 74. Lydia Helor Tejada was born in 1921 in Bolivia to a German immigrant father and a Bolivian mother. Her cousin was American actress Raquel Welsh. She married twice and had a daughter. After university, she joined the center-right revolutionary nationalist movement. In 1952, the party drove the Bolivian revolution and took power. Lydia became a member of Congress. In 1964, the party was toppled by a military coup, and Lydia went into exile for 15 years. She returned to Bolivia, changed allegiance, and became vice president of the Revolutionary Party of the Nationalist Left. In 1979, she became head of the lower legislative house. That year, the presidential election was a draw. The president of the Senate was appointed temporary president pending a new national election. He was overthrown by a military coup, and Lydia was appointed new temporary president. She oversaw the new election, but before the winners could take power, Lydia was overthrown by another military coup. She fled to France until the fall of the dictatorship in 1982. Lydia served as ambassador to Colombia, West Germany, and Venezuela. She opposed the U.S.-backed war on drugs in Latin America, participated in feminist and human rights organizations, and wrote two books. Lydia died in 2011, age 89. Eugenia Charles was born in 1919 to a wealthy Dominican family. She attended the only school for girls on the island at the time. She worked at the Colonial Magistrates Court and took an interest in law. She attended the University of Toronto in Canada and London School of Economics and passed the bar in the United Kingdom. Eugenia returned home to become Dominica's first female lawyer. She established a practice and was a director at her father's bank, where she set up the nation's first student loan system. In 1960, she began campaigning against the government's restrictions on the press. In 1975, she was elected to the House of Assembly. She supported Dominican independence from Britain in 1978. Her party swept the 1980 general election, and Eugenia became prime minister. In her first year, she rebuilt after Hurricane David and survived two attempted coups. One was orchestrated by American members of the Ku Klux Klan. Eugenia worked two additional jobs as foreign minister and minister of finance. She made headlines worldwide in 1983 when she met with U.S. President Ronald Reagan. They allied in an invasion of Grenada to stop the nation becoming communist. 
Eugenia was re-elected in 1985 and 1990. She supported social welfare, anti-corruption laws, and individual freedom. She was uncompromising and became known as the Iron Lady of the Caribbean. She retired in 1995 after 14 years as Prime Minister. She made speeches around the world to promote human rights and fair elections. Eugenia died of a pulmonary embolism during hip replacement surgery in 2005, age 86. Now, let's take a quick look at a few more fascinating stats on women world leaders. The longest serving female world leader was Angela Merkel, who was Chancellor of Germany for over 16 years. Vigdis Finborgdotter was President of Iceland for 16 years. Eugenia Charles was Prime Minister of Dominica for 14 years. Sheikh Hasina has been Prime Minister of Bangladesh for 14 years and counting. Mary McAleese was President of Ireland for 13 years. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was President of Liberia for 12 years. Tadia Halonen was President of Finland for 12 years. Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister of the UK for 11 years. Indira Gandhi was Prime Minister of India for 11 years. And Chandrika Kumaratanga was President of Sri Lanka for 11 years. Archaeologists and historians don't agree on exactly when and how patriarchy came to dominate nearly every society but it may have started during the Agricultural Revolution, around 10,000 BCE. Men had the benefit of being physically larger and more aggressive, and they didn't bear and were far less involved in the raising of children. This gave them the edge on claiming leadership positions at every level of society, while women were subjugated to being viewed as property. This developed into a worldwide mythos that men are actually intellectually and emotionally more fit to rule than women. As monarchies emerged and thrones were passed down generations, brothers outranked sisters if women weren't barred entirely from the succession. A handful of females came to occupy thrones through combinations of genetic luck and outliving or outwitting their male relatives. Some were remarkable leaders, others less so, but all faced doubt and challenge because of their sex. As absolutism made way for democracy, men were already at the helm, and their positions went unquestioned, at least by those who had a say in the matter. In 1893, New Zealand became the first nation to grant women the right to vote. Women spent decades demanding their rights and finally gained suffrage in Finland in 1906, Australia in 1908, the UK in 1918, the US in 1920, the Republic of China in 1947, and Saudi Arabia in 2015. Today, women can vote in every nation in the world, save one, the Catholic state of the Vatican, where only cardinals elect a new pope. Voting is a vital first step in ensuring that the voices of women are heard by our governments, our rights are protected, and our needs addressed. The mythos that men are more capable of leadership than women is still very strong, but numerous studies have shown that this just isn't true. Just to name a few, Harvard Business Review found that female leaders were rated higher than their male counterparts, both before and during a crisis. Pew Research found that women leaders were ranked higher than men in both politics and business. Women were rated better at compromising, being honest, improving quality of life, and standing up for beliefs. This follows through in the kinds of issues the UN records female politicians most often prioritize. Supporting families, children, and the elderly and disabled, social affairs, environmental issues, and employment and gender equality. Also, according to the UN, only 28 of the 195 countries in the world currently have a woman as head of state, i.e. president, or head of government, i.e. prime minister. That's 14%. Only 21% of government ministers around the world are women. And only 26% of all national-level legislators are women. 
At the current rate, it is estimated that we won't reach equality until 2150. Of the 195 nations recognized today, only 88 or 45% have ever elected or appointed a female head of state or government. Of those, 23 have had two. Only nine have had three or more. Haiti, Iceland, India, Lithuania, Moldova, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom have all had three. Finland has had four, and Switzerland has had five. It is interesting to note that the two nations who have elected the most female leaders are ranked the fourth and first happiest nations in the world. Each year, the United Nations publishes the World Happiness Report, which quantifies various measures of quality of life around the globe. These include GDP, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and corruption. Many of these are issues female politicians are more involved in than their male counterparts. When we look at the rankings of which nations were happiest in 2022 and highlight which of those have had at least one woman in the top office, we can see that happier nations are more likely to have had female leaders. Or is it that when nations give women a chance to lead, they become happier? The third happiest nation without a female leader is the United States of America. I find it deeply vexing that my own country and one of the world's oldest surviving democracies has continuously failed to elect a woman to the top seat. So will more women get a chance to lead their nations in the future? Are little girls who dream of being president or prime minister likely to get a shot? While we are nowhere near equality yet, it does appear we're moving in the right direction. When we look at how many female leaders gained office in each decade, there is a healthy upward trend. Only one took office in the 1940s, no women in the 1950s, three in the 1960s, six in the 70s, 11 in the 80s, 27 in the 90s, down to 23 in the 2000s, and then more than double to 55 in the 2010s. We're only three years into the decade of the 2020s, and so far, 23 new female world leaders have taken office. If the trend continues, we will likely see more than 76 women sworn in as presidents or prime ministers before the decade is out. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.